Assalamu alaikum. I'm Professor Dr. Haider Jawad Mubarak. This is a presentation to embryology of the nervous system. Uh, during the third week of development, we have a trilaminar germ disc which is formed of ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. At the end of the third week, the anterior part of the ectoderm is thickened and start to form a thick neural plate which is shown in number two here. This neural plate then will extend along the whole line or the whole uh, germ disc, trilaminar germ disc as a thickening of the ectoderm and the midline of the uh, trilaminar germ disc which is shown also in this figure in number two. Then after this thickening of the neural plate, the thickening of the ectoderm, will start to fold and thus forming the neural folds. These neural folds will increase much and much to be closed forming the neural tube. So we have a thickening of the midline ectoderm forming a neural plate that is folded forming a neural fold and then the folds close to form the neural tube. And you can see these changes here very clearly. This is the neural tube which is opened from the front and from behind. Later on, this opening, the anterior and posterior opening of the neural tube which are called neuropores, must be closed. And uh, the anterior neuropore will be closed on day 25 while the posterior neuropore will be closed on uh, day 27. You know that everything anterior develops more than the posterior. Then, if we consider that this is the shape of the tube, the anterior part of the neural tube will show dilatations, while the posterior part remains cylindrical. The posterior part that remains cylindrical will form the spinal cord, while the anterior part that dilates, that shows dilatation, form pre three primary brain vesicles which are forebrain called the prosencephalon, midbrain called mesencephalon, and hindbrain called rhombencephalon. And what's going on that these three brain vesicles, prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and uh, rhombencephalon, will become five vesicles. How is that? The most anterior one, which is the forebrain, will divide into two. And the most posterior one, which is rhombencephalon, will divide into two. The middle one, the mesencephalon, the middle brain, remain as itself. It will not change. So, there will be five physicals from three physicals because the first one and the last one will divide into two. So, the forebrain, the prosencephalon, will form a bilateral outpocket called telencephalon. And this telencephalon will form the cerebral hemispheres. And the cavity of the telencephalon will be the cavity of the cerebral hemisphere, which is called lateral ventricle. So we have two cerebral hemispheres, and each of them is a lateral ventricle. The other part which is derived from the forebrain, from the prosencephalon, is the diencephalon. The diencephalon will form structures as uh, thalamus, uh, hypothalamus, subthalamus, epithalamus, and metathalamus. So the forebrain vesicles will form two secondary vesicles, telencephalon and diencephalon. The hindbrain also will form two secondary vesicles. The anterior one is called metencephalon, and the posterior one is called myelencephalon. The metencephalon will form the prone and cerebellum, while the myelencephalon form the medulla oblongata. And this is the uh, text representing this description. In embryo, especially in your lab, when you will examine the slides of chicken embryo or the slide of uh, rat embryo or mice embryo, in embryo you may find angles or constrictions that make you uh, demarcate these five brain vesicles, the secondary vesicles. So these angles are only important in embryo. One of these angles is called cervical flexure. 
it is between the myelencephalon anteriorly and the spinal cord this is the spinal cord the first angle after the spinal cord is the angle with the myelencephalon here also this is an angle with the myelencephalon which is called cervical flexure the ne next angle is the pontine angle or pontine flexure it is between the between the meten and myelencephalon you can see that there is an angle between meten and myelencephalon and embryo this angle is called pontine flexure cephalic flexure is the angle of the midbrain you can see that the midbrain is angulated and this angle of the midbrain is called cephalic flexure and you have a pont a rhombencephalic isthmus which is between the mesencephalon anteriorly, the midbrain anteriorly, and the metencephalon anteriorly. So you have cervical flexure between spinal cord and myelencephalon, pontine flexure, which is uh, between uh, the meten and myelencephalon, this is the pontine flexure. Uh, cephalic flexure or cranial flexure in the midbrain and a narrowing or an isthmus between the metencephalon and midbrain called thrombencephalic isthmus. This figure also shows you that this is the cerebral hemisphere which is derived from the telencephalon and in the center of the cerebral hemisphere is the diencephalon which is the thalamus, epithalamus, subthalamus, hypothalamus and metathalamus in addition to the derivatives of the or structures derived from the telencephalon and diencephalon next you will have the midbrain which is not divided into two vesicles it remains as only one midbrain and then you have pon and cerebellum which are derived from the metencephalon this is the pon and this is the cerebellum next is the medulla oblongata which is derived from the myelencephalon and next is the spinal cord and this is the text repeating the talk. You can see that the cerebral hemisphere, which is derived from the telencephalon, have a cavity inside it which is called lateral ventricle, while the cavity of the diencephalon is called third ventricle. And you can see that there is a small foramen which is called interventricular foramen connecting the lateral ventricle, which is in the cerebral hemisphere, with the third ventricle, which is in the diencephalon you know the third ventricle is a single cavity in the diencephalon the lateral ventricles are two one of them is the in the left hemisphere and the other is in the right hemisphere and both the uh, right and left uh, lateral ventricles are connected by right and left interventricular foramina with the single third ventricle the cavity of the midbrain <coughs> which is the uh, mesencephalon is called aqueduct of salivius <clears throat> the cavity of the metencephalon and myelencephalon, which is the cavity of the rhombencephalon, therefore, from the, la the fourth ventricle. In the brain, we have right and left lateral ventricles connected with a one third ventricle by interventricular foramen of Monroe, the right and left interventricular foramen of Monroe, connecting the lateral ventricle with the third ventricle, then the third ventricle connected with the aqueduct of salivius of midbrain with the fourth ventricle which is the cavity of the meten and myelencephalon or we can say it is the cavity of the rhombencephalon and this is the text describing what I am saying finally the caudal neural tube from the spinal cord the spinal cord as you know contain a central canal and so the cavity of the neural tube uh, will form the cavity of the central canal of the spinal cord and you can imagine that the lateral ventricles the third ventricle the aqueduct of salivius and the fourth ventricles are derived from the cavity of the brain vesicles which are originally a cavity of the neural tube after describing this details gross changes of the, the neural tube and the brain vesicles we have to say something about histology development of the neural tube which is histogenesis actually the neural tube initially is formed of pseudostratified epithelium this pseudostratified epithelium lining the neural tube will proliferate 
forming a cellular mass around it, which is called mantle zone or mantle layer. These cells of mantle layer derived from the neuroepithelium are forming, will form neuroblast. And then the neuroblast in the mantle zone will form nerve cells. And because neuroblast will form nerve cells, the nerve cells of the mantle zone will have axons and dendrites. The axons and dendrites will form a layer outer to the mantle zone, which is called marginal zone. Therefore, the marginal zone contains processes, axons, and dendrites of neuroblast cells that will form neurons in the mantle zone. Actually, the mantle zone derived from the neuroepithelium will form a bilateral ventral basal plates, which are motor in function, and a bilateral dorsal alar sensory plates, which are sensory in function. And you can imagine that in the spinal cord, the bilateral basal plates will form the ventral gray horn of spinal cord, while the bilateral dorsal plates of the mantle zone will form the bilateral dorsal horn of spinal cord. And the marginal zone to the outside of the mantle zone will form the white matter of the spinal cord. Also, you can see that the mid-region between uh, the alar plates, the right and left alar plate, is called roof plate, while the mid-region between the right and left basal plate is called floor plate, and the groove between the ventral plate, the uh, ventral uh, basal plates, motor plates, and the dorsal alar plate, this mid-region is a sulcus called sulcus limitans that divides the basal plates ventrally from the alar plates dorsally. In the uh, spinal cord levels of T1 to uh, L3 and in level of S2, 3, 4. In addition to the ventral motor plate and uh, dorsal alar plates, which is sensory, we have intermediate plate that will form the autonomic uh, system or autonomic cells. You know, T1 from L1 contains sympathetic nerves in the lateral horn, while S2, 3, 4 contain parasympathetic nerves. So the spinal cord in this level T1 to L3, S2, 3, 4 will form here also a lateral horn in addition to the ventral motor plate and uh, the alar uh, dorsal sensory plates. In these segments we will have intermediate plate that is sympathetic in T1 to L1 and parasympathetic in S2, 3, 4. In addition to uh, neurons derived, the neuroblast, and then neurons from the mantle zone, the neuroepithelium also form a glioblast that form the glial cells. And <coughs> uh, also the uh, neuroepithelial cells lining the neural tube will form the ependymal cells that lines the central canal of the spinal cord and lines the ventricles of the brain. Uh, these are the lining that are lining of the cavities containing the CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. Therefore, the neural epithelial cells, which are pseudostratified cells, will produce later on ependymal cells lining the central canal of the spinal cord and lining the walls of the ventricles of the uh, brain and the aqueduct of salivius of midbrain. Some of the nerves are myelinated, the others are not. Myelination in the peripheral nerve occurs by Schwann cells that encircles the axons. While the axons in the central nervous systems, apart from the peripheral nervous system, is uh, for derived from oligodendrocyte. Uh, Schwann cells form myelin sheath around the peripheral nerves in the fourth month, while myelination in the central nervous system, as in the gray matter, as in the uh, spinal cord white matter, or the white matter of the brain is derived from the oligodendrocytes in the fourth month also just like that of the uh, myelin. But the difference between peripheral myelination by Schwann cell and central myelination by the oligodendrocytes that central myelination or myelination of the nerves in the white matter of the brain uh, is not completed in, during intrauterine life as uh, myelination of the nerve fibers in the white matter of the brain continue till the first year after birth, first postnatal 
Uh, here. If you know in general if you from your histology uh, demarcation uh, that until what we had described in regard to uh, development or histogenesis of the neural tube, we said that first we have neuroepithelium to outside is mantle zone and to outside is marginal zone and the marginal zone is formed by uh, nerve fibers axons and dendrites of the cells the neural cells in the mantle zone this is a configuration that uh, simulates that of the spinal cord the spinal cords contain gray matter then to outside of it is a white matter just like the mantle zone and marginal zone but the problem is not with the spinal cord or even with the brain stem uh, the difference is with the cerebrum and cerebellum because in the cerebrum and cerebellum you have outside the white matter is a cortex which is a gray matter so in the brain stem and the spinal cord you have outer uh, white matter and inner gray matter just like this figure an outer marginal zone that could form the white matter and inner mantle zone that form the gray matter but in Apart from the spinal cord and the brain stem that simulate this figure, the cerebrum and cerebellum have an outside a cortex which is a gray matter. So from where this cortex, the outer gray matter of cerebrum and uh, cerebellum, actually was going on, that some of the cells from the neuroepithelium proliferate and migrate, crossing the mantle zone and then crossing the marginal zone to form an outer cortex of cerebrum and cerebellum which is a gray matter and it, it, this is what is described here it says that the neuroepithelium derived cells cells from the neuroepithelium migrate across the mantle and marginal zone to form the outer cerebral and cerebellar cortices which is our which are gray matters in addition to that you know we have alar sensory plates and the basal uh, motor plates the alar plates only in the forebrain grows further than the basal plates in the forebrain which is the cerebral more specifically uh, the cerebral hemisphere which is derived from the telencephalon so everything simulates each other except that in the telencephalon the alar plates grows more than the basal plates and therefore the cerebrum will have much uh, structures that are related to sensory function because more structures are derived from the alar plate which is sensory in the hind brain there will be folding of the alar plates the folding of the alar plates will form the so-called rhombic clip and this rhombic clip will grow to form the cerebellar hemispheres the nuclei in the cerebrum the nuclei in the cerebra, cerebellum and the nuclei of the brain stem which are actually the nuclei of the cranial nerves all are derived from mantle zone so the mantle zone will form central nuclei or deep nuclei of the brainstem which are some of them contributing to cranial nerves they are cranial nerves nuclei and in the cerebrum and cerebellum neuroanatomy you will find that inside the white matter there is a gray matter called central nuclei of the cerebrum or cerebellum also are derived from mantle zone of course if they are nuclei related to motor function they are derived from the basal plates and if they are nuclear uh, for sensory functions so they will be uh, they are derived from the alar plates there is a peculiar feature for the spinal cord development the spinal cord fill all the vertebral canal during intrauterine life till the third month of embryogenesis but later on the vertebral column grow more rapid than the spinal cord 
Therefore, at birth, the spinal cord will end at the level of the third lumbar vertebrae, and then at adulthood, the vertebral canal grows further, so the spinal cord lower end ascends up to be at the level of L1 vertebra. So at the third month, the spinal cord pulls all the vertebral canal, but later on, the spinal cord ascends at birth to L3, and at adulthood, it ascends further till L1 level. Anomalies. We will start with the description of anomalies of the spinal cord. Actually, anomalies of the spinal cord are related to abnormal closure of the neural tube. You know we have a neural plate that is folded forming a neural folds, the fold close forming neural tube and a neural tube. The neural tube, if it is felt to be formed, there will be a case which is called the spina bifida. Actually, it is a deficit in the vertebral arch and the uh, 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 that is what is described as embryology of the skeletal system of the vertebra. So actually it is a defect in the arch of the vertebra that is associated maybe with a defect in the neural tube. Spina bifida defect in the spinal cord occurs in three forms. Spina bifida occulta, spina bifida cystica, and rachiscuses. Spina bifida occulta mean not clear, occulta. Here, we cannot see that there is a defect in the vertebral arch. The only uh, abnormality seen is here in the back of the patient in the lumbosacral region. And if you take an x-ray for this patient, you will find that the vertebral arch is deficit. And here, the patient has no any neuronal defect. He is normally in regard to motor and sensory function. Spina bifida cystica, in which you have a cyst, on the back in the lumbosacral region because the defect in the vertebral arch will allow, will allow herniation of the meninges and this is called meningocele or herniation of the meninges with some of the neuronal tissue which is called meningomyelocele and of course if it is meningomyelocele it will be associated with defect in the motor or sensory function but if it is only defect in the uh, meningocele herniation of the meninges the neuronal defect is not present. In addition to spina bifida occulta, spina bifida cystica, the rachis kisses or myelos kisses is a flattening of the neural tube. This is a figure referring to the rachis kisses or myelos kisses. You don't have any vertebral arch and you don't have any neural tube. And of course, uh, this uh, defect uh, with severe neuronal defect and uh, the, patient, the, the newborn will not survive. You can see how the spina bifida could be diagnosed by ultrasound of the uh, baby inside his mother, and it could be also diagnosed by x-ray after birth. You can see the defect in the vertebral arch. Pituitary gland or hypothesis. I think most of you not know uh, what is meant by pituitary. This is the pituitary. It is a gland below the brain, below the thalamus, which is diencephalon. This is the pituitary. It is called also hypothesis. The pituitary uh, is derived uh, from two regions, from ectoderm of the oral plate. This is an embryo, which is actual chick embryo. And this is the mouth of the embryo. From the roof of the mouth, there is a pouch of ectoderm of the roof of the mouth, which is called Rathke's pouch. This Rathke's pouch is formed during the third week. This is the Rathke's pouch. It is a pouch from the roof of the oral cavity, from the ectoderm of roof of oral cavity. It is formed at the third week of development, uh, from the roof of the stomodial oral cavity, anterior to the bucopharyngeal membrane. You know what is bucopharyngeal membrane? It is fusion of the ectoderm and endoderm. This Rathke's pouch will form the anterior pituitary, which is called adenohypophysis. Also, it will form pars intermedia of the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is formed of anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary, and in between the anterior and posterior is pars intermedia. So the anterior pituitary and pars intermedia are derived from the Rathke's pouch, uh, which is called, uh, the anterior pituitary is called adenohypophysis. 
The posterior pituitary, which is called the neurohypophysis, is derived from infundibulum, from the diencephalon, which is this one, and fundibulum from the diencephalon, which is called neurohypophysis. So the posterior pituitary is derived from the diencephalon and fundibulum that will form the posterior pituitary, which is called also neurohypophysis. Sometimes Ratke's pouch form a tumor because when the Ratke's pouch will form the anterior pituitary, remnants of it must degenerate. But if remnants of Ratke's pouch remains, it will form a tumor uh, of embryonic origin uh, in the region of the pituitary that uh, is in the cella torsica of the skull. There are other defects in the brain. Uh, one of them is the absence of midline structure of the head. So you will find that the fusion of the nose, fusion of the eye, the, the uh, baby will have a single eye. This condition is called holoprosencephaly. It is loss of midline structures of the neck, of the head. Thus, you will have fusion of the nose, fusion of the eyes, everything in the midline is diffused because the midline structures are absent. It's called holoprosencephaly. Anencephaly, which is a large opening in the cranial vault with degeneration of the brain, was also considered with the anomalies of the skull. Also, meningocele and meningomyelocele had been described with uh, cranioscases of the skull, a small opening in the skull in which you will may have herniation of the meninges, which is called meningocele, or herniation of the meninges with the brain, meningoencephalocele, and there is a CSF with it, it will be called as meningohydroencephalocele. Sometime you have hydrocephalus, which is increased CSF uh, pressure inside the skull, uh, because uh, the CSF flow is obstructed. you may find a large baby head, which is called hydrocephalus. Finally, we will have to describe something about the suprarenal gland. The suprarenal gland histologically is formed of a cortex and medulla. The, the uh, medulla is derived from the neural crest cells, while the cortex is derived from mesodermal tissue which is formed in the region between the root of mesentery of small intestine and the gonad, and this mesodermal tissue migrates to the adrenal gland. Therefore, it is said that the medulla is derived from the ectoderm because the ectoderm is the source of the neural crest, and the neural crest forms the medulla of the suprarenal gland or adrenal gland, while the uh, uh, cortex is from the mesoderm. The only thing that uh, I want to add that uh, you have to know that the name of a tumor which is derived from an eminence of Radke's pouch is called the craniopharyngioma. And that's all about the CNS, uh, the development or embryology of the nervous system. Thank you very much.